Myths are powerful tools that help to convey the identity and cultural rules of a given society. They help to tell the story of a people, who they are, where they came from, and perhaps where they are going. Today, we will take a look at the legendary figure from Japanese myth and a kind of precursor to the grand stories of the samurai, Takeru Yamato. Howdy! And welcome to episode 14 of the Plutarch Project podcast. I'm your Kakui host, Josh Sensei. Thanks for listening. We'd like to thank you all for your continued support. We also hope you enjoy this podcast and that you find yourself enjoying the holiday season. Don't forget to check out the transcripts. We've added all kinds of stimulating links and art to help you visualize the world of ancient Japan. So now it's time to grab your very best ceremonial kimono a nice glass of Okinawan awamori, and have a lovely sit at your kotatsu while I dive in through your ears and into your heart and mind. We're traveling way back to ancient Japan. Takeru Yamato was, for a large swath of time, considered to be a real flesh-and-blood human. But as time has rushed by, scholars mostly believe that he was either a compilation of heroes all sewed together, or his story was greatly embellished to support the cultural narratives wishing to be told by the powers that be. It might be easy to think of him as a kind of Japanese King Arthur. As with many grandiose figures, the history leading up to them is just as fascinating as they are. We will be relying on two sources for today's podcast, the Nihon Shoki, which was completed in 720 CE, and the Kojiki, finished in 712 CE. Both accounts of Takeru Yamato's life are similar with one striking difference, which is his relationship with his father, the 12th emperor of Japan, Keiko. In the Nihon Shoki, Takeru is the heir to the throne and is considered to be the ideal Confucian son. In contrast, the Kojiki paints him to be a bit of a trickster, and just one of many princes, and not really in the running for the next emperor. In this telling, his father hates him. For those versed in Japanese history, you'll notice that the people mentioned today will have multiple names. Quite often, common names were given to mythical or historical figures posthumously and compiled in the aforementioned text's authors. Trust me, the common names are much easier. Before getting into the life and times of Takeru Yamato, we have to go back to the 10th emperor of Japan, Sujin. Sujin's reign has been conventionally attributed to reign from 97 BC to 30 BC, but other sources have him living in the 1st or 4th century CE. Due to the lack of accurate records, details can get a little murky. Records that do exist have him living to be a cozy 119 years old at the time of his death. He's known for appointing the first shoguns, chief military commanders, which helped to set the stage for Takeru's exploits, as well as the rise of the samurai class later down the line. Takeru's father, Emperor Keiko, has very limited information available, and what is available is often conflicting. He is known for expanding the borders of the empire, but take it with a grain of salt, he is also said to have lived to be 142 years old. Takeru Yamato was born sometime around 72 CE. The Nihon Shoki describes him as, quote, When he was young, he had a warlike spirit, and when he was grown, his appearance was extremely notable. His stature was 3.3 meters, and his power was such that he could lift a giant bronze cauldron." Unquote. There isn't much information on his younger years available, so we will have to begin at a time when he was a young man, about 16 years old. One day, his family sat down to have a nice dinner. His elder brother had not come to the family meals for a few days. Takeru called upon him, but still he did not join. Several days later, the emperor then asked about his elder brother and if Takeru had taught him a lesson yet. Takeru replied that he had indeed taught him a lesson, and the emperor asked him how he went about it. Takeru then replied, quote, In the early morning, when he went to the privy, I grasped hold of him and crushed him, and, pulling off his limbs, wrapped them in matting and flung them away, unquote. The text doesn't say anything else about the matter. His father, noticing his warring ways and violent energy, 
sent him away to help establish order among some of the other provinces. Takeru was first to travel to Kumaso and Izumu provinces, which in contemporary times are Kyushu and Shimane prefectures of Japan. He was just barely a man when his father asked him to do this. On Takeru's first journey, he used trickery to accomplish his missions. He requested the aid of the best archer in the empire and several others to help him accomplish his missions. In Kumaso, he arrived in the village of a chieftain, Kawakami no Takeru, who had shown opposition to his father, Emperor Keiko. After arriving in the village, he found that the chieftain's house was heavily guarded, as was a nearby cave that was preparing a banquet in his honor. People were buzzing about inside, in preparation for a great feast. Takeru disguised himself as a maiden and entered the house and hung out with the women. He was later invited to the cave to drink with the men. The Nihon Shoki states, quote, Kawakami appreciated this young girl's figure and therefore led her by the hand to the same seat and raising his cup made her drink and was amused by her entertainment, unquote. After the chieftain and his compatriots were drunk, Takeru revealed his sword and stabbed another one of the rebels in the chest. Kawakami jumped up from his seat and began to flee. Takeru thrust the sword into his buttocks. Kawakami asked that the sword not be removed because he had something to say before dying. Kawakami asked the name of his killer, and upon finding out he was the prince, he renamed him. Quote, Kawakami said humbly, I am the strongest and most powerful in this country. Therefore, up to this time, many people have failed to win against my aggressive force, and no one can match me. I have met many strong warriors, but not yet one like this prince. If this worthless rebel's coarse mouth to offer up a title, will you allow it? Takeru Yamato said, I will permit it. Then, he said humbly, from here on, the prince ought to be called Yamato Takeru no Miko. After he had finished speaking, he passed the sword through his chest and killed him. Therefore, up to now, he is called Yamato Takeru no Mikoto. This is the reason, unquote. After Kawakami's death, Takeru's compatriots revealed themselves and slayed everyone at the banquet. He had one more stop to make before heading home. In the Izumu province, he met another chieftain. Rather than attack him, Takeru befriended him. As their friendship grew, he was able to get closer and closer to the chieftain. During this time, Takeru secretly fashioned a wooden sword and began carrying it around concealed in a sheath. One day, Takeru invited the chieftain to bathe with him. While bathing, Takeru proposed that they trade swords as a sign of friendship. The chieftain agreed, thinking he had secured an imperial ally. After bathing, Takeru challenged him to a friendly duel, the key word here is friendly, with their new swords. As the duel began, the chieftain quickly realized the sword was wooden and was then slayed by his own blade wielded by Takeru. After finishing the task, Takeru sang an ode to the deed, quote, Alas, that the sword girded on the Izumo Bravo and wound round with many a creeper should have had no true blade, unquote. Takeru and his companions returned home to report the success of their mission. In the Nihon Shoki, Takeru returns with great praise from his father. He bids him to continue his great work by pacifying the barbarian tribes to the east. Emperor Keiko states, quote, I hear the eastern barbarian's character is violent and strong, and are wholly maliciously criminal. Their hamlets have no chief, their villages no leader. Each is greedy of their territory and they steal from and attack each other. Also, their mountains have perverse gods, and their suburbs have noisy demons. They barricade the highways and block the passes, and make much hardship for the people. Within these eastern barbarians, the emishi are especially strong. The men and women live in common, and paternal relations are not distinct. In the winter, they stay in holes. In the summer, dwell in nests. They are clothed in hides and drink blood, and even brothers suspect each other. Climbing mountains, they fly like birds, and going in the grass, they run like dogs. They forget past favors, but upon seeing hatred, they always revenge themselves. 
They hide arrows in the hair of the head, and knives within their clothing. And evildoers gather and attack the borderlands, and they wait on the harvest to attack the people. When they attack, they hide in the grass, and when they flee, they run into the mountains. Therefore, since ancient times, they still have no system of kingship. Now I see you have become a man, your body tall and large, your stature proper, your power can carry a bronze kettle. Your bravery is like lightning. No enemy can stand in the direction you face. And the place you attack, you will certainly have victory. By this it is known that you are my son, and you are a divine human. Truly, heaven th sympathizes with our foolishness, and the country is in unrest. Will you put into order this heavenly endeavor, and not cease in revering the court? Also, this realm is your realm, and this position is your position. I wish you to deeply plan your tact and seek out the noisy, examine the rebellious, show them this power, use the virtue of conciliation, do not bother with warrior's armor, and naturally institute vassalage. Use clever words to appease the violent gods, and martial force to break the noisy demons." Unquote. Takeru accepts the mission and heads east. In stark contrast, in the Kojiki, Takeru returns home, hoping for praise and honors from his father. Instead, he is greeted coldly and given the task of pacifying the East without the long-winded speech given in the Nihon Shoki. Before leaving, Takeru visited his aunt, the high priestess of the great shrine of Ise. He arrived depressed and confessed to his aunt, quote, It must surely be that the heavenly sovereign thinks I may die quickly. For after sending me to smite the wicked people of the West, I am no sooner come up again to the capital than, without bestowing on me an army, he now sends me off afresh to pacify the wicked people of the twelve circuits of the East. Consequently, I think that he certainly thinks I shall die quickly." Takeru burst into tears, fearing an untimely death. His aunt, seeing his fear, bestowed on him a mythical sword, the heavenly sword of gathering clouds was given to help aid him on his journey. She also gave him a bag and told him not to open it until he was in dire need. The sword's history is deeply rooted in the origins of Japan and its primordial deities. The son of the original deities ruling over the world, Izanagi and Izanami, was Susun Susano, the god of storms and the sea. He is quite often referenced as the impetuous male. At his birth, he wailed for his mother, what we would now deem to be thunder. He wailed so hard and for so long that his father banished him into the underworld for a time. The older Susano was a moody god who, in a fit of rage, would hurl thunderbolts across the heavens. Once, when he was particularly angered, he threw a dead horse at his little sister, Amaterasu, the goddess of the sun and the universe, causing her to go into hiding, which caused a very long winter. It was Susano who discovered Heavenly Sword of Gathering Clouds that would eventually find its way into the hands of Takeru Yamada. In the province of Izumo, Susano came across a grieving family. He learned of the existence of a giant serpent that had eaten seven of the family's eight daughters. The serpent had eight heads and eight tails. The tails filled up eight valleys, and on its back grew great forests, both protecting the serpent and hiding it. This serpent had a taste for fine maidens and sake, a Japanese rice wine. Susano, wishing to slay the beast, laid a trap for it. He used a beautiful young maiden from the aforementioned family as bait and placed her on a raised platform. He then had eight gates constructed leading to the platform. Below the maiden, but also raised, he placed giant barrels of sake. The serpent eventually took the bait. It had no interest in the young maiden, but its heads quickly rushed into each gate to drink from the barrels of sake. After it had become drunk, Susano leapt from his hiding place and hacked off the heads of the serpent. Susano then began cutting up the body and tails of the giant creature. In the fourth tail of the serpent was a metal object. It was the heavenly sword of gathering clouds. He married the young maiden he had used for bait, and he gave the sword to his sister, 
Amaterasu to settle the grievance of him throwing a dead horse at her. The sword was eventually placed in the great shrine of Ise and given to Takeru to aid him on his journeys. The sword still forms one of the three imperial treasures of Japan. These treasures haven't been seen by common people for hundreds of years, but we may have a chance to glimpse them, at least wrapped up in packaging, when the new emperor is crowned this upcoming year. From the shrine, Takeru traveled east, stopping once in the land of Wohari. He went into the house of Princess Miyatsu. He decided that he would marry her upon his return journey. From there, he departed eastward again, cutting down rebels and deities as they appeared. The texts are really vague here, and there is not a lot of information on how he went about this mission or which deities he slayed until he arrives at Sagamu. The regional governor of the land feared Takeru and despised the emperor, so he hatched a plan to kill Takeru. He asked Takeru for his help, stating, quote, In the middle of the moor is a great lagoon, and the deity that dwells in the middle of the lagoon is a very violent deity." Unquote. In other versions, the regional governor states that the area is known for its great hunting and asks Takeru to bring back a freshly killed deer or boar to feast upon. Takeru made his way toward the moor, but upon entering the great grassy field, the governor's men set fire to the field. Takeru became trapped by the flames. Remembering his aunt's words, he opened the bag. Inside was a tool used to stomp out fires. Takeru used the mythological sword to cut away grass and the tool to stomp out the fires around him. He quickly realized that the sword, when thrust like a scythe, generated a great gust of wind. Takeru began swinging the sword, forcing the flames back toward the governor's men. They were eventually consumed by the flames. Takeru escaped and avenged their plot by killing all the rulers of the land. The sword was then renamed Kusanagi, translated as grass-cutting sword. Takeru then headed toward the sea in search of the Amishi. Upon arriving at the shore, he laughed at the channel they had to cross, stating, quote, This sea is tiny. I could almost jump across. Unquote. He then set sail. Soon after, a storm arrived, causing the sea to swell and toss the boat about. Takeru's consort, Princess Tachibana, then sacrificed herself to ease the waves and allow Takeru to continue on his mission, stating, quote, Now the wind generates waves, and the prince's boat is going to sink. This is certainly the will of the sea god, Watatsumi. I want you to take my feeble body and, for the prince's mission, throw it into the sea." Unquote. The winds died down, and Takeru continued on his journey. At the port of Taka, the emishi waited for the arrival of the emperor's men. Upon seeing Takeru, the emishi trembled with fear. Instead of fighting, they threw down their weapons, entered the sea, and helped Takeru's boat to shore in safety. They then tied their hands and surrendered to Takeru without bloodshed. Thus they survived and faced no recompense for their previous actions. Other emishi in the area continued their rebellion against the emperor. Takeru traveled through the land, slaying them whenever he found them. He traveled through the land, eventually rising to a summit of Ashigara Pass, overlooking the land of the emishi. He decided this was a good place to stop and rest for a while. A mountain god saw him resting and decided to pester the prince. He sent an inquisitive deer to try and steal his food. Takeru threw a piece of garlic at the deer, hitting it in the eye. The deer died instantly, and a great fog fell over the mountain. From somewhere in the mist, a white dog appeared and led him out of the fog to safety. Prior to Takeru's arrival, the mountain was known for its fog, which often resulted in sickness. After his departure, the people began chewing and then rubbing garlic on themselves and their animals for safe passage over the mountain. Takeru then began his journey homeward. He returned to the land of Wohari and wed Princess Miyatsu. He stayed there for one month before hearing of a local deity causing problems, the deity of Mount Ibuki. 
he left his mythical sword in the princess's house and decided to take on the deity with his bare hands. In the Kojiki, Takeru came across a giant white boar the size of a full-grown cow, and in the Nihon Shoki, it is a giant serpent. Takeru thought that this creature must be a messenger of the deity and that he would kill it on his return journey. The creature was actually the deity in disguise, and after Takeru had passed and climbed higher up onto the mountain, it sent forth a hailstorm. The hail pummeled Takeru until he fled to the base of the mountain, a broken man. His wounds were serious, and he tried to travel back to the capital one last time to see his father, the emperor. He never returned home to his wife. Along the way home, he fell even more ill and finally died. The Nihon Shoki reads, quote, I received the order of the imperial court to conquer the faraway eastern barbarians. Thereby I prayed for the gods' favor and depended on the emperor's power and the rebels were made surrender for their sin and the violent gods naturally appeased. Then wrapping up my armor and staying my halberd, with heart at ease I came back. My wish was always some day, some time, to report back to the imperial court. However, suddenly the come to an end, and it cannot be stayed any more than a cart by a crack in the road. Now I lie down, alone in this field, with no one to speak to. How can I regret dying? Rather, I regret that I could not meet you again." Unquote. In the Kojiki, his final words were, quote, The saber sword which I placed at the maiden's bedside. Alas, that sword! Unquote. After his death, a messenger was dispatched to his wife and children, as well as the emperor. Takeru was 30 years old at the time of his death. The Kojiki says nothing in regards to the emperor, but that Takeru's wife and children lamented his death and built a mausoleum at the place of his demise. In the Nihon Shoki, the death of Takeru was taken quite differently. Quote, when the emperor heard this, he could not sleep soundly, and food lost its flavor, and he wailed day and night, and cried in sadness, and beat his breast. Then he said with great mourning, My son, Imperial Prince Osu, previously in the day of the Kumaso rebels, he was still not of the age to tie up his hair, and long he labored to conquer, and since then was by my side supporting me in what I could not do. However, the noisy action of the eastern barbarians, there was no one to send to attack them. Hiding my love, he was sent to the rebel frontier, and not one day passed when I did not think of him. The morning and night did not proceed, and I waited for the day of his return. What disaster is this? What crime? In the space of not even thinking, my child is lost. From now on, with whom will we manage the realm? Unquote. Both versions find a unified ending, though. After the burial, a giant white crane escapes from the mausoleum and flies off into the sky. The mausoleum was checked, and only Takeru's clothes remained. At each place the bird stopped to rest, a shrine was built in honor of Takeru, until finally the bird took flight into the heavens, never to be seen again. Although the tale of Takeru Yamato ended, his image has been used to help generate a national identity and to inspire others to give their lives in battle to honor the emperor. In World War II, Takeru was used to represent the ideal loyal subject. Scholars after the war have shown how the idea of Takeru has helped to crystallize pre-imperial Japan in the public consciousness. Takeru Yamato has also found his way into contemporary media, including anime, novels, and movies. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you liked it, consider supporting us. You can review us on iTunes or your podcast service of choice. Tell a friend or tell a mistress or even subscribe. If you really liked it and want to help us continue, 